Hello and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga Show with me, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 491. That's 491 of the Agostino Zynga Show. How you doing? How you feeling? Great, amazing, good to know. If it's your first time checking out the show, please make sure you smash that like, hit subscribe, and leave me a comment down below. If you're listening via the podcast app, a five-star review will help the show to go a long way. It only takes five minutes to do, probably less than five minutes, maybe two, maybe three minutes. If you could extend that courtesy to me or that favor to me, not courtesy, it's a favor, then I would greatly, greatly appreciate it. Of course, support for your patrons also welcome at patreon.com, for just Agostino. You can find that link to the Patreon in my show notes descriptions. Just click the link. You'll find all the details there that you need, but basically you can only subscribe for as little as one dollar equivalent of one pound per month and you get access to all my bonus episodes i've just about put up in um an audio essay an audio diatribe where i basically recount some of my explicit activities in the clubs as i went over the weekend so if you want to know about all of that then make sure you tune into my patreon and yeah here i am back on the pod hope you guys are doing well wherever this may catch you um, obviously I'm banging out the pods and trying to get them as consistent as I can three times per week I was doing two but now I'm doing three I even ran up to four or five last next week just to test it out and see how much content I can produce out of this tiny tiny black body of mine um, what has been going on not much really kind of ramping up for the weekend um, obviously looking forward to doing some activities getting up to some things the plan is to possibly go out on a Friday and then obviously go out on the Saturday um, the plan is to go to maybe Wendy's or maybe on a Saturday they've recently opened around the corner from where I live so that should be nice to sample that menu and see what that's saying and then potentially head over to Fabric on the Saturday evening and see what that's saying and just catch a vibe um, you know, enjoy the atmosphere and the new surroundings and just kind of immerse myself in that place again because i haven't visited i think in maybe more than 10 years and so the last time i've actually stepped in foot of for fabric so it would be nice to go there and revisit it sometime um that should be good and then on a friday what's good plan i'm thinking of going inferno it's a club night a queer club night i guess you'd call it in um is it what they say what would they call it queer or they say it's lbtq friendly i don't know wherever it is it takes place in the color factory not too far from where i live again near hackney wick so maybe that's an option too to go to loads of things on the docket i will then you know be looking forward to updating you later on in a week as to what i do most likely i probably will go out on a saturday because i want to do a little field recording that i'm going to then include in my podcast episode that i upload on patreon only so if you want to hear some of my again some of my escapades that i get up to on a saturday then you have to tune into the patreon so of course make sure you subscribe and jump on there but i definitely want to go out on a saturday record some film recordings record some audio clips as i'm outdoors and just generally put that together maybe on a sunday and drop it on the monday tuesday that's definitely the vibe that i'm going for but in the meantime i decided to resurrect and to bring back to life my website quote unquote my squarespace that i had where i basically made it the one-stop shop for all of my stuff that i do all the things that i try to get up to all the kind of creative little projects that i try and do and it's yeah it's back up and running so if you've ever wondered um what i get up to um you know kind of wanted a one-stop shop to find all my stuff and all my links then definitely check out my website it's agassinozinga.com I have at the moment my blog link there, which I haven't uploaded, updated in a while, but definitely check that out because some more content will be heading that way very soon called Default Goon. I have my DJ profile on Resident Advisor with all my gigs and stuff. I was going to put DJ bookings and gigs, but it just sounds a bit cringe. I just put DJ there. I've got photography, which I've just uploaded loads of um, photography pictures that I took over the years that I thought were a fair, accurate representation of my style and the kind of stuff that i like to shoot so if you like to see that kind of stuff some of my photography that i've taken over the years and definitely check that out i've got loads more roles of films that need to be developed that that's probably and that's probably going to end up into being being put into a new project probably a zine and maybe later on down the line hopefully an exhibition but i'm going to hopefully put that together sometime very soon so keep an eye out for that but i recently re-uploaded loads of um, pictures from my archive that i thought again fairly represented my kind of style in that regard um also of course uploaded um links to my podcast i've got a link there of course to my dj soundcloud page my youtube page and of course you can contact me on this button here so if you're again curious about what i do 
you just want to find a one-stop shop for all things including me or you're just curious about me in general then definitely check out my website axionzinger.com i'll be updating this of course over the next coming days with various projects and stuff that i'm going to do there'll be a store there, there as well that i'll link to do i'll be selling zines and some merch just miscellaneous stuff that i've made over the years and obviously some new fresh stuff that's coming to projects you can wait for so definitely check that out and yeah i'm excited man i'm excited i'm i kind of had it la- i lay- uh, had it laying dormant for a while as you can tell the logo i quickly just you know wrote something on a bit of paper and scanned it in and uploaded it so it's not it's not really well done as, as i'd like it to be done but hopefully over time i shall get it where it needs to be but i kind of laid off doing it mostly because i hadn't really done much in terms of creative content that like i'm proud of showing off but now that i'm kind of doubling down and putting a lot of content together creating things just being creative basically and for lack of a better term i feel like the best thing to do is to resurrect it and to put basically leave it as a platform where i can upload most of that stuff that isn't just stuff that sits on instagram the instagram obviously will be a great way to kind of broadcast and signal boost the stuff that i do but i also want to have a standalone site that i can periodically update things on there too so definitely keep an eye out for that um projects are going to be coming thick and fast over there loads of updates especially on a photography front like i said i've got you know 50 plus rolls of films that need to be developed i'm going to select some of the best pictures obviously select those and put them into a zine maybe select those and may, maybe make a story out of it maybe you can you know make some of it into an artwork and then hopefully present that into an exhibition very 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 soon so i'm looking forward to doing that that was a great project i was able to finish today and then of course i was planning on doing maybe a little cheeky paris sessions tomorrow recording it and then maybe uploading it later on in the evening but i'm not too sure if that's gonna happen but if it doesn't then definitely keep an eye out for that as well i'm gonna be doing some dj streams on a regular basis now maybe sometime every week just gonna be banging them out again and again and again and again so i can keep that consistency going especially now that my gigs have kind of dried up i might as well just kind of quote unquote book myself and stream online because effectively the level the playing field has been leveled somewhat we're all kind of in the same boat so i might as well just keep doing that and and plus is kind of fun i have to be honest it's really fun to do that and i'll probably end up doing a few of those live instead of pre-recorded as i was doing them previously because why not why the hell not anyway loads of things to talk about loads of things to jump into so let's just get right on in get yourself a drink a little snack or whatever it may be and let's dive on deep into the topics of the day so first things first i'm sure most of you are aware that drake's um albums due to come out very soon certified lover boy the album cover was released um to um you know mix reception for the most part i think an album cover designed by damien hurst i think we we soon learned later on um it's these emojis of these pregnant ladies all different colors and creeds um that's plastered on the front of the album cover which i'm sure once we hear the album it'll make a lot more sense but as it stands it just looks a little bit naff especially when you consider all the theatrics and the creativity and the avant-garde nature of Kanye's approach when it comes to Donda to see somebody just stick a couple of emojis on the front of the album cover it feels like a little bit of an anti-climax but again I'm sure once the album drops and we listen to it from front to back it'll all make a lot of sense but I really like what they did in terms of activations this way when it comes to um announcing the features it's not really a thing that you actually hmm, yeah this is interesting you don't really hear people usually maybe i'm not mistaken in recent years i've not really seen features being made of such a big deal like this usually obviously if you're an artist you want to try and make people remember that it's your album right and you've got an album coming out you want all the tension to be on you you don't necessarily want them to be on your features so either you hide them under the guise that you want the features to be a surprise or you just announce them just a normal way where they're just part of the track listing. But Drake, obviously being Drake and being one of the biggest stars in the world, decided to hire out all these billboards around the world and basically, I guess in the locations where the featured artists are from and plus the fact that, hey, New York, the GOAT is on CLB, um, you know, alluding to the fact that, you know, um, Jay-Z was going to be an album. It's not really alluding, it's kind of stating it, you know, point blank, because who else is going to be the GOAT unless he's kind of mentioning Nas or something. Has there ever been a Drake and Nas track? There probably has, right? I can't think of one at the moment. But anyway, um, so he's announced it this way, and I think it's a fairly creative way to announce it. Um, if anything, again, it's another reminder why as much as it's annoying i think some people yeah going back to the donda thing i understand some people don't like donda mostly because of the theatrics i think kanye has kind of worn people's patience right and people just don't want to put up with him anymore and i guess all the um, 
games and the many listening sessions and everything that came before that made people just get tired of him and they wanted just to move on they had enough of being consistently bombarded with his content and because Kanye is a flipping one man content machine and he's a one man viral machine and every flipping news outlet wants to cover him because I know he gets clicks he's going to be consistently pushing your face so even if you don't want to listen or you want to don't want to know what he's up to you're going to be forced to know what he's up to so I can understand how people's fatigue with him comes but unfortunately this whole like rollout stuff this whole big you know song and dance and big budget you know um whatever things that they do and advertisements have to be done to gain people's what to get people's attention for the most part because people's attention is so splintered all over the place and it's hard to hold it for a long time which probably explains why drake did this approach where he basically rolled it out over the period of what hard roll out if it was like a couple of weeks right just to get people's attention to remind them hey i'm gonna come i'm coming soon i'm coming soon i'm coming soon and then now obviously they're ramping up as as the release date um you know kind of nears in a few hours basically at the time of me recording this i'm recording this at like 1 a.m or something right so as much as it's annoying this is just going to continue because like i said everybody's attention is just spread so thin so these artists especially the higher up ones who are spending a lot of money on their albums have to make sure that people are listening to them to recoup whatever they spent on it so they're going to do whatever it needs to be they're going to light a girl on fire they're going to put an emoji on their cover they're going to rent billboards they're going to do anything just to make sure that they are in the new cycle and then the hope is if your music is good it won't really matter all the theatrics you do because once the music drops everyone will forget about all these billboards right that's the good thing so so far the announcements have been jay-z is going to be on the album little wayne kid cuddy we've got thames nice good um good representing for the afro beats um we've got travis scott we've got yeba we've got give you an entire dollar sign that's going to be a smooth track we've got little dirk your young fuck oh little dirk's looking mighty cute there isn't it we've got young fuck future 21 savage little baby we've got rick ross and that's it right so far um the kid cuddy one's a big um one in it that's a big deal because if anything if you if most of you guys know that they had a a pretty it felt like tetchy beef where it felt like you know there wasn't going to be any kind of reconciliation coming anytime soon. If I'm not mistaken, wasn't Drake saying something about Kid Cudi's mental health and said something like he should kill himself? I don't know. Something like, you know, something that would you would think had crossed the line to the point where there could be no resolution. But it's good to see that they've kind of been able to uh, make... Um, make amends and make music together because if there's one thing you know that's going to sound amazing it's Drake with Kid Cudi they've got a sim I wouldn't say similar sort of vibe but in terms of sonically how they put songs together their melodies and stuff I think they're going to go well really they're going to go together really well I'd be interested to know what Kanye thinks about um, Kid Cudi's relationship with Drake because I'd imagine he probably doesn't like it especially with their back and forth weird beef that they have going on at the moment but I wish just to see what that ends up sounding like but yeah um, big deal when that ends up coming out I'm sure everyone's going to be replaying it a lot more than they probably should and I, I wouldn't be surprised if people start saying they love the album a lot more than they actually do just to spite the Kanye thing because of how protracted that's been and because how much of a journey it's been and for some people torture so they're going to go out of their way and say yeah this is the one this is what hip-hop sounds like but you know people who talk about bullshit so here's an article here as well touching upon the damien hurst designed album cover courtesy of artnet it says it turns out damien hurst is behind the totally bizarre and suggestive cover art for drake's new album it says nearly nine months of delays and bizarre promotional stunts. Drake's long anticipated new album finally has a due date. It's a sounded like a pun because it is when the rapper recently took to Instagram to confirm a six um, studio record set by Loverboy will be released on Friday, September 3rd. He also shared a cover art and image of the dozen pregnant women emojis set against a white backdrop. And it wasn't the only per surprise. Per Drake's rep, Damien Hurst indeed responsible for penning it. So pretty, pretty fly to go out and get Damien Hurst to design an emoji cover in it that's pretty far i wonder how much he invoiced drake for this mate imagine that god damn uh real house heads may no, may have not needed the confirmation squint your eyes enough and the rows of equally spaced multiracial women almost look like the british artist signature dots um hearse also turned to pregnant women as a symbol before such as his two of 200 2005 2000 200 I said 2005 public sculpture um virgin mother for drake though the cover is hardly to 
harder to justify maybe it's implying that his music is to make um is to make babies too or that the tunes themselves are simply so sexy that they conceive a child listening to them at least one person online suggested that he's secretly messing up um facing up to having father 12 children yeah i don't think that's true let's see anyway when it when it eventually drops i'm interested to see in terms of the name of the album and obviously the cover it'd be really cool if it ends up being an incredibly hardcore drake on his rapidly rap shit with maybe a couple of r&b pop tracks here and there for the ladies but if for the most part it's just pure raps that'd be a sick kind of turn for the books i think a lot of people are anticipating it to be a lot more melodic because of the name of the album but i think that's maybe is a, that maybe is a bit of a false flag that might be a bit of a distraction and i think it might be very rippy rap i don't know why but i've got a feeling it's going to be just drake going hard on the bars especially when you think of the recent you know skirmishes and back and forth kind of stupid things he's been having with kanye online it feels like this is the time where he's just going to need to remind everybody hey i'm the big dog i'm the guy don't test it you know what i mean don't come near don't compare no one's no one's close to me i am the one and i think we're going to get that with this album i imagine so and people will say he needs a classic he's a classic they might be right he probably does need to have a solid body of work that just is banging from front to start and i think he's going to be capable of doing it it's, a, it's been a long time covid lockdown all that malarkey the album's going to need to slap for him to justify going on the massive world tour which he's probably going to announce probably what a week later a week after this when it ends up dropping we'll probably hear um news of a north american tour european tour war tour very soon so definitely be prepared to be hearing this everywhere everywhere again i'd, I'd love i'd love it if we had like a spot somewhere in london where people just played banging albums like this when they came out just from front to back i remember back in the day we used to get that with um craig wade big up him wherever he is now at the moment i'm not sure if he's still in the uk but whenever he used to dj at visions he'd always be playing the new shit that dropped that day and it'll be nice to hear dj playing stuff that just released a couple of hours ago on the actual club system right and you're just off your head you're just going going for it it's just it's sick um it's all well and good listening to it at home and you're flipping wireless headphones but i want to hear it on the club system surrounded by strangers right it's that too much to ask um we don't really have those things anymore i remember back in the day we used to have those things in shoreditch like those kind of like drake nights and beyonce nights where basically the premise about it was you'd obviously play you know for the most part drake music from the beginning to the front but it was more so a celebration of his music and everybody's associated with the stuff that he does so you could get away with playing people that were featured on their tracks their tracks and that sort of stuff but the general theme was to kind of celebrate drake beyonce fujis whoever it may be and i wish we had more of those now those kind of naff kind of open-ended um open naff kind of naff open format sort of club nights as opposed to the kind of really um you know intellectual kind of things that people are doing now um i wish that could happen but you know whatever here is what it is i guess if i want to hear it loud i could always book a little session into pyro studios and just have it blaring in one of their recording rooms or something in it so it's not much to miss on on that one let's continue let's continue okay cool so as i mentioned in an, what the stream the other day actually thank you so much for everybody else that tuned in i'm doing these live streams called open tabs i kind of do them you know randomly here and there late at night i probably do one on the saturday going to sunday before the ufc card coming up and essentially i just kind of ramble and talk about random stuff i found all over the internet not too dissimilar from this show that i do here which is a bit more purposeful more topics but hey we move we move and at the time that i did the open tabs live stream a story just broke about um Ari hawani and brendan Shaw having a bit of a tete, -a -tete about you know Ari Hawani's growing presence on Showtime and Brendan Shaw feeling as if like he's the reason why he got the job in it really strange beef really odd but regardless it's still kind of funny to watch from afar especially if you have no real um, dog in the race but there's been another development off the back of the video I did previously the other day it looks like um, Ari Hawani is really sticking Ari Ariel Helwani let's go slowly Ariel Helwani is really sticking the boot in Brendan at the moment and it looks like until he gets his public apology he's not going to stop he he was recently on the Pat McAfee show, kind of basically, you know, going over his grievances with Brendan Shaw. And I think it was pretty funny appearance all in all. And it made me really kind of wonder and question as to 
why everyone seems to really, really dislike Brendan Schaub, especially when you compare him to somebody like a Pat McAfee who's on the show, right? Um, whose show this is. Um, if I'm not mistaken, Pat McAfee wasn't a, you know, uh, an elite American football player. He was, if, if I'm not mistaken, a kicker, right? I think he's spoken about it in very um, funny, self-deprecating uh, manner a few times on his show. And from what I know about American football, kickers are fairly easily replaced and not really well regarded in a team of in American football, I guess, in terms of important position um but the fact that he was able to take that role um or take that career that he had and segue into this amazing me re uh, media career i think for a short time wasn't he on barstool and now he's doing kind of his own thing and kind of balling out um just the other day he a clip of his went viral on twitter where he's essentially i think he's still now he's at home right because i think he recently contracted covid and he just was like still recording even on his sick bed sounding you know sick as a dog so people just seem to love him as a personality. And I really do wonder why it seems like Brendan Shaw doesn't seem to get the same amount of love, especially when you consider that he's coming against someone like Ariel Hawani, who in my opinion, again, not the biggest, you know, um, um, what you call it, geek when it comes to understanding who the journalists are in MMA. I mostly just watch most of the UFC cards, prelims. I mean, early prelims, prelims, just keep it moving. I don't really listen or watch kind of some of the content around some of the journalists or whatnot. I don't really keep attention to it, maybe apart from the odd Luke Thomas thing here and there, but I kind of just stick to watching the fights himself. But from what I know about Ariel Hawani, he's not the most likable person either. But why is it for whatever reason, everyone seems to like Ariel Hawani in this beef but no one's really backing brendan Shaw. like there's been hardly any people in my comments in the previous video that i did come into brendan Shaw's defense and saying oh no everyone is being unfair he's picking at him this is this is stupid he needs to grow up but no one's saying that if anything everyone's just like applauding ariel for having the guts to kind of quote unquote stand up to brendan because obviously most people treat him with kid gloves because he's you know joe rogan's boy which was understandable too because no one wants to fuck up that joe rogan bag either or that joe rogan opportunity right i completely understand that but it's just interesting just to think about it from Pat McAfee's point of view. We look at Pat McAfee, who's kind of similar to what Brendan Shaw is in terms of media personality, in terms of, you know, having a fairly mediocre sports career, but then segued it into being this media behemoth, right? Global star, whatnot. But for whatever reason, people seem to like Pat McAfee more and they hate Brendan Shaw. But I don't really know. But let's watch the clip regardless. This is um, Ari Hawan is sitting down in Pat McAfee and detailing exactly what his beef grievances is and why he's going so hard at Brendan Schaub. And if I'm being honest, I've been sitting back for the past 18 months and I've seen a lot of people take shots at Hiawani. And if I'm being honest, I would... Even his voice. Like, how does this guy win against Brendan? If you're Brendan Schaub and you're a stand-up comedian, a professional stand-up comedian, let's say that, and you're touring around the country and you've got a Showtime special, you can't be letting this guy dunk on you like this. Look at the way he looks. Look how he sounds. And he's actually, you know, slapping, slapping him around on the internet, right? The the T-Pack K subreddit is on fire. They've christened him the new CEO. He's christened himself the new CEO, CFO, maybe alongside um, Brian Campbell, of course. But it's just incredible, isn't it, to see how easy it's been for him to kind of completely turned the entire internet against Brendan Shaw at a flick of a switch. Crazy. I was told time and again not to punch back. Well, guess what? I'm punching back. And Woo! I'm not sitting back and letting anyone talk shit about me anymore okay. because I'm tired of it. And especially, look, like I said yesterday, you could talk smack about me being a bad journalist, a bad personality, a bad reporter, a bad host, a bad this, a bad that. But don't lie about me anymore. I'm not going to take the lies. So yesterday I spoke about an individual named Brendan Schaub who was lying constantly about me. And uh, it's kind of funny. I put out a little bat signal on Twitter the night before that some people on Reddit, shout out to those people, knew what I was talking about. And all of a sudden I get a text. I get an apology. And I said to Brendan, who I've never had an issue with despite all the shots, I said, cool. If you're going to apologize to me privately, I hope you're also going to do so publicly because that's where this started. You smeared my name publicly and lied about me publicly and said I was a bad teammate and a bad colleague publicly. And you said that you got the job first from Showtime and I only got it because you turned it down publicly. So I want you to go on your public little show and I want you to apologize to me. And so once he does, the beef will be squashed. Until he does... We'll see what happens. We'll see what I choose to do. Okay, well, there's a lot that just happened there. First of all, yeah. congratulations on finding your voice. Yeah. Hell yeah. 
But again, isn't it? What a turn for the books. Who would have guessed it? The guy that most MMA fans for a while had hated or were basically made to hate because of his kind of ongoing beef with Dana. A guy that Dana probably wishes would just fall off of a cliff somewhere has now become what? The sort of, um, you know, the the favorite of everybody right now everyone's rooting for him everyone kind of wants him to see him succeed and stuff and it's just interesting to see how the table has turned but i'm just curious to see how brendan shaw basically navigates this because if there's one thing we know about him he kind of does find it hard to laugh at himself he does kind of find it hard to poke fun at the way that he speaks and the way that his career has basically evolved over the years and that's probably maybe is the genesis and the root of maybe some of the disconnect he has with some of his fans or people that maybe aren't necessarily the biggest fans of him in general um i don't necessarily get it like i said he's you know he might be a, an annoying character in general but i think there's definitely is some credence or something to the fact that he warrants or he kind of if he kind of emits such visceral hatred to some people i long hypothesized that i thought the reason why brendan was so hated by a lot of people was that for whatever reason he seemed to remind them of people that they grew up with in school maybe people that bullied them maybe people who they thought were dumb as bricks but you know always ended up kind of landing on their feet you know that kind of person that you kind of resent when you're growing up as a kid you know doesn't study doesn't do anything doesn't try it but always seems to kind of figure stuff out along the way i can understand if you're struggling and you're working your ass off and you've got three jobs and you're putting yourself through school to see someone like that succeeding can be a little bit of a hard pill to swallow obviously it's not beneficial and it's not going to serve you any any it's not going to serve you well to kind of hold that resentment in you but i can understand why you have it so that's where i thought it kind of came from but over the years i was like no i don't think it is that i really don't think i think there's enough assholes over the years who have made it a success for it that's a too much of a simplistic reason i think maybe part of it has to do with the fact that for whatever reason people generally think that his success isn't deserved i don't know why that is don't get me wrong because i still think you know don't get me you know, let's call a spade a spade brenda's not gonna be where he's at without joe rogan by his side cool but he still had to work his ass off to get where he is now right um t5k say what you want about it but when it first started off it was one of the best podcasts out right it really kind of fell off of a cliff really quickly or he kind of nosedived incredibly quickly and maybe because of brian callen's insistence to try and make it as an actor they had loads of stops and pauses and things got disturbed a little bit and brenda was trying to do his media thing for a little bit but if they were maybe both aligned from the very beginning in terms of trying to make that product as best as they can to try and make that podcast the best podcast that they could ever make it and just double down on that maybe it would have been a different thing but in general the fact that he's kept that thing alive and it's still like the main cash cow for everybody and it provides provides an income for a lot of people it's provided a platform for people to go on and do big bigger things and whatnot it says a lot about his temperament and his work ethic and his drive for sure you can't deny that so let's not say that he's only here or he's only successful because of joe rogan because that's insane he's obviously he played a huge part in it no one's denying that i don't think brendan gets where he's at without joe but he's definitely where he's at now definitely due to his hard work but there definitely must be something in the fact that people generally think that he doesn't deserve any of his um, success. They just don't think he does deserve it at all, especially when it comes to stand up. That's probably the main thing I saw. When it, as soon as he took that Showtime special, it felt like the entire internet turned on him. They're like, why would you take that? First of all, why are you being offered it? Because they didn't think it's funny. And why would you take it now at this stage of your career? It doesn't make any sense. But obviously, it, it, you know, if we're, if we're being honest too and look at it from a critical, well, look at it from an objective point of view, it was a smart decision to make because effectively the long play was that he wanted to have his brand be associated with serve time. He went to kind of worm his way in there and kind of get into the combat sports commentary boxing thing. And the best way to do it was obviously to take the Showtime deal and then hopefully use that to segue into doing his obviously below the belt show that led to other situations. So all in all, it probably worked out better for him. But in terms of his public perception, it hasn't really helped. But in general, this beef for the for the most part is mostly centered around jealousy, mostly centered around, you know, feeling threatened and feeling as if somebody's taking your clout somebody's taking your position and if you know it must hurt if you're a brendan shaw and you're seeing somebody who is essentially a dork taking your spot something that you kind of built from the ground up you know the you know whatever you know, from, you know what i mean right the, the, the fact that he's got that spot at showtime he was the main guy for a lot for a long time now he's kind of slowly being replaced by luke thomas and brian camp and brian bc sorry and obviously um eri hawani so i can understand why it can feel that way but there is something um 
interesting about men and how we display our jealousy and how we display our resentment and how we display our anger right we always try to sound like we're being um we always sound like we always try and sound like we're being not reasonable but we we try our best not to sound bitchy but we are sounding bitchy and this is a great example of it so this is basically the genesis of the issue that they're basically having where brendan shaw basically sits on his podcast and i think this is below the bell and basically details um you know the things that he's heard about Ariel Hawani and why he thinks he's not a good teammate and all that malarkey. So this is what Brendan Shaw thinks of Ariel. This is what basically set Ariel off, if I'm not mistaken. So I I I will say this: I've never personally worked with Ariel ever. He's a real journalist. Journalist, I'm a guy that tells dick jokes and talks about whatever the fuck I want to talk about. You know, so he's always been like the company guy. He's stop there. I always thought that was a cop out because he doesn't want to do the work. Because one of the things that I think is incredibly frustrating about Brendan, even though he, again, I think if you look for it from an objective point of view, the fact that he's been able to make money and drive a purple Porsche and live in a mansion, speaking the way he does, right, is incredible. That should give anybody motivation. If you think you're not going to be able to be a success in front of camera because you stutter or because you've got speech impediment or because you're just dumb then definitely look at Brendan Shaw but he can definitely be a motivation because despite all of his flaws and all of his shortcomings he's still steamrolled his way through and been able to make a success out of himself so congrats to you congrats but the really interesting and weird thing that that's really frustrating about Brendan is that he's a former high level say what you want you know maybe the era wasn't that great but it doesn't matter he was still a top 10 top 15 heavyweight at his time right in the ufc right the you know that's the highest of the highest when it comes to mixed martial arts um obviously golden gloves all that malarkey whether or not you believe it or not is whatever but the fact that he's got such kind of credentials and doesn't use those credentials to his advantage with a sprinkling of research, with a sprinkling of kind of whatever industry gossip that he knows because he's been in these gyms, he's trained with these people to kind of inform and to add to his kind of analysis of fights and breaking down of cards and whatnot is a real crying shame. And I think he kind of, his easy cop out to not do the homework is to say, this is a lifestyle show. I don't do that kind of thing. I'm not a journalist. I just do this. I shoot from the hip. It's like, no, brother. Maybe do some, maybe prep in it. Maybe do some work. Maybe research the cards that you're going to be talking about on your show before you sit down. Maybe go over some of the topics that you're going to be reading on the, off the screen from Chin that he kind of just pulled up the day before. Maybe do some level of work and, just, and then again, add some of your insights, some of your second nature thing that comes because obviously you are a professional fighter yourself and then that will then take you to the next level. But he just doesn't do that, which is probably the reason why people like Eri Hawani and these kind of people have been able to kind of leapfrog him because what they have is that they have that geek journalistic side of things where they're able to just be analytical and be obsessed with all the numbers and the stats and all this malarkey and then over the years of being in front of camera and doing live streams and calling shows and working for that company and this company they've suddenly you know developed a personality over the years right no one can deny that luke thomas is a far better broadcaster and presenter on youtube or just in you know on video in general than he was a few years ago he's a lot more uh, a likable person Maybe because he's sitting next to BC for the most part, but he comes across a lot more likable. And it's no surprise that Eri Hawani has now kind of implemented that same kind of idea in the stuff that he does, which is no surprise too that Showtime would decide, hey, let's put this guy in, you know, um, if uh, on this coverage for right front and center. And for whatever reason, Brendan just didn't do it. I, I just don't get it. It's such a missed opportunity. He's a, he's a suit guy. He's a real journalist. He's probably the best journalist we have in the game. He's the closest thing we have to Stephen A. Smith, right? He doesn't have those opinions, but he, as far as straight journalism, he's he's the guy. He's the kind of the, the standard, I which God bless him, he's worked his ass off for. The wow. only thing I've heard about Ariel, and I've heard it from a million people, mm -hmm. does not play well with others. Yeah. Anybody I know who's ever worked with him does not have nice, th nice things to say. Just imagine if somebody said this about Brendan. That's the funny thing about men when we hate, right? We always like we can be the biggest hypocrites at times. We don't want to hate, we don't want to gossip, but we then are spreading these, you know, unsubstantiated stories around, especially given your platform that you're on. And he's fair, don't get me wrong, you're allowed to say what you want to say if he's had this experience with people. 
if he's had this experience and he's been told or relayed these stories by others about their experience with Ariel, cool, he's allowed to share them. But it's just interesting to note that somebody like him will be sharing these kind of stories because you just know if somebody did the same thing to him, he'd be branding them haters and, you know, cheater fingers, trolls on Reddit. He would not be having it. This would be something that he would be losing his marble off of. So for him to sit there and kind of accuse somebody else of being difficult to work with, it's just insanely funny especially when you read between the lines and hear about the things that people say about him and how he goes about doing things. But, you know, that's a thing for another day. Anybody I've ever talked to in the MMA space says do not work with him. Now, I never judge a book by its cover. I'm sure people have had their issues with him. I've never worked with him, nor would I, I have no reason to. You know, he's a journalist, not what I do. Uh, but I've never had any issues with him. But anybody I know, people that I consider friends, People in that MMA journalist space say he's an absolute nightmare. Isn't that funny when you say I don't judge a book by its cover, but then you go and judge a book by its cover? <laughs> it's hilarious, isn't it? But anyway, that's the beef. It's a bit all worthy to be honest. Who really gives a crap? These guys are just pissed off because they're not going to be able to get their whatever 30 grand per episode flipping gig and, you know, Brendan's worried that if he loses that job, he's not going to be able to keep up his car payments, essentially. That's what's kind of driving the beef. I think if, if he's being honest, he should have seen this coming. Um, you you know, you're not that great at your job. So somebody else came in and took it. It is what it is, a game to game. But he was able to make a decent amount of money during that time when he did have the job. And now he's getting able to do his own thing with his kind of fit boy studio stuff, isn't it? It's all good. But it's just funny to see that Ariel's the one that's putting all the pressure on him online um, with these flipping, give me a public apology, all these sorts of jibes. Um, I, I wonder what the public apology is going to sound like. <laughs> that's why I'm wondering. What's that going to sound like? Because if we know one thing about Brendan, he doesn't really take too well to being called out like this. He always gets a little bit angry and mad. <laughs> he doesn't really like people talking bad about him in public. So let's see what happens. Um, but yeah, just funny how dudes react, man, when they when they are when they kind of being sent out to pastures new and somebody says they don't really like what they do it's just interesting man guys react in a very interesting manner that has to be said um what else we have to say let's move on from that oh let's talk about this this is courtesy of hype beast it says the basement serves up two two suede coated takes on the new balance 2002 r's so um i have to be honest i doubted these guys the basement kids right but over the years they have cultivated and put together one of probably the most um i won't say substantial but whatever it is one of the most important platforms exists at the moment for kids communities right um where they kind of help to bolster a community help to get people jobs hold on one second no it's not this is that yeah anyway yeah the basement are doing great stuff. You know, the past collaborations I've been a fan of. I liked all everything that they put out so far. I'm not going to lie. Um, I would probably personally wear these myself, but you know, I don't know. I like them. I like them. I like them. Actually, no. Let's move on. I'll talk about something else. I can't bother talking about these. They're just New Balances out green, and it who gives a shit. Um, let's move on. Um, yeah, I saw this. This is one thing. So this is an. This is kind of off the back of that um, controversy that happened a few weeks, a few weeks ago, actually. Beyonce and Jay-Z, Tiffany Diamond, supposedly might be Blood Diamonds, all that malarkey. I don't really care. Put that news to one side. But there was one bit of um, video footage that came off of it that just kind of wrangled me and kind of rubbed me up the wrong way. And um, again, it's a shame because I'm a fan of the model use. Um, Alton Mason, I follow him on Instagram. I think it's a pretty good follow. Um, you know... Uh, a really striking incredibly look good looking model um and whatnot whatever it's just my one of my little you know um uh, guilty pledges in terms of a follow but it's just so cringe seeing this type of stuff in fashion or with, when it comes to luxury brands i've really had enough of seeing black people dancing jumping around break dancing running jumping into flowers or whatnot like just enough black people smiling in places i'm not sure if this is like a weird reaction that people are having guilt reaction they're having to the tragedy of george floyd that happened obviously that they're trying to now kind of overcompensate by placing black people in ev in every single piece of content that they put out there especially brands that have no real um synergy or affinity or connection with black culture whatsoever especially in north america i just don't understand it what does tiffany have to do with hip-hop what does tiffany have to do with jay-z and beyonce what does tiffany have to do with jay-z and beyonce's fans i don't know don't ask probably just a 
numbers thing probably but this advert is just takes the biscuit for me i'm not gonna play the music because it's obviously copyrighted and whatnot and i don't want to get nabbed off the flipping net but essentially this video for those of you listening i'll play it uh it's the oh, let's pull the sound off obviously you can hear it um it starts off you know panning into some sort of basketball court in the middle of america out to mason's dress death to a nine in a tuxedo for some reason break dancing in the middle of the basketball court and doing this what's well, not even break dancing he's doing this weird kind of you know performance dance piece move things whatever it is mix of break dancing and whatever other moves skateboarders are you know spinning around him pop shoving all over the place a couple of big spins here and there playing basketball really poorly i just don't get it i really don't and i really do think it's kind of embarrassing i understand you have to get to the bag and you have to secure it and you want to place yourself next to these brands and for sure whoever owns tiffany is probably the conglomerate that whoever, yeah the conglomerate that owns tiffany is probably a brand or a company that you want to align yourself with so you do a favor for that smaller brand or to get you to the other brand that you actually want to work with but in terms of optics and in terms of kind of allowing us to allowing us I, tell, I say as in black people to feel comfortable within the luxury space or comfortable within fashion this isn't what we want what we want is to have a seat at the table you want to be part of the decision making process you want to be a change maker you want to be able to give other people jobs you want to have a job for yourself and obviously be able to maybe get a job for somebody else um you want to get yourself in these rooms you want to have to be able to have your application be actually considered and not just be thrown in the bin those are the things that you want to actually make monumental and impacting and long lasting change right you want maybe to be able to go into an internship and have that internship inform some of the stuff that you do for your own little collection but what you don't want to see is an advert pandering to you trying to make you feel comfortable for what because i mentioned to someone the other day actually um if i was to rock up to tiffany's now with a skateboard and my trousers sagging um, you know and whatever listening to whatever i was listening to in my headphones and i tried to walk in there and shop in peace i probably wouldn't i wouldn't have the greatest of time i'd probably have a security guard following me everywhere i went and it would be a really uncomfortable moment until i decided to pull out my wads of cash and display that hey i too can afford the things in this in this shop right so all this pandering they're doing doesn't make any sense because no one in that basketball court with the exception of Alton mason and even him depending on what store he goes to would get ha would get hassled in there so all of this posh all this pandering all this performative stuff doesn't necessarily inform any of the day-to-day -day decisions that go on behind the scenes at stores like this or that inform the things that they do in general it's just one of these weird token gestures that they do to make it look like they're doing something and they're not but i'm sure they'll put this in a deck i'm sure this will be part of their like diversity and inclusion thing like hey look what we've done we've featured this many people from all these different countries it's like jog off jog off give those jobs to people who are living in a local area you want to have a a collection inspired by new york city maybe go in i don't know um sponsor a prize at a local flipping design school somewhere for underprivileged for un, uh, for disadvantaged kids i don't know do something actionable do something that's actually going to give back to um a community and actually lay some roots and actually give people an option a chance to get out of the struggle that they're already in but all of this stuff is just like what is this like what is this and again it's not dancing it's not nothing it's just some guy that's really kind of you know athletic i guess and maybe has got a background in gymnastics that's able to do these weird moves but it's not exactly like he's dancing it's not exactly like he's busting the move or it's not exactly like he's part of the culture himself is it it's just so detached from what change we actually want to see and again it's just a shame that it's alton mason because again i'm a big fan of the dude i like him but i just don't want to see anyone black people dancing in adverse anymore especially for these luxury fashion brands or luxury brands in general because it feels like they're just pandering and using us as flipping diversity tokens and flags in order to get themselves you know social media clout points and stuff it just feels yucky it really does it feels yucky i feel yucky watching it i feel yucky consuming it i feel yucky 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 that's it just yuck so yeah um not bigging up tiffany and co who gives a shit in it who gives a shit move on what else we have here what's i gonna talk about to you before i spit dazzle we're not gonna talk about that we're not gonna talk about that yeah, let's talk about this a little bit so 
Um, as I mentioned on the show, the other no, I mentioned on the live stream, it looks like Joe Rogan has contracted COVID. Unfortunately, the daddy of this podcasting thing, right? Our sort of forefather, the one that laid down the path for all of us to kind of traverse over, has unfortunately been stricken by the COVID. He's stricken by the COVID, which is hilarious because if you've listened to the previous or maybe a couple of previous shows before of the Joe Rogan podcast, especially the one with Dr. Rhonda Patrick. Joe's on a mad tip. I'm not sure what's happened to Joe over the years or especially over the years, over the last couple of 18 months and stuff, but something's happened to him because there was a period when COVID started, I think when he was in the old studio, maybe it was in still in LA at the time where he interviewed one guy. I think it was a scientist or a virologist. I'm not really too sure. A bigger dude, a white dude, a kind of a fat guy, right? who was kind of um, sounding the alarm of how serious COVID could be when this was people weren't really sure what's happening. Da, da, da. And Joe was really kind of um, gripped by it and very cautious and, you know, making sure he was, you know, putting as much information as possible, people to be wary and to take all the necessary precautions and whatnot. And then for whatever reason, something changed within the next six or eight months and he went the opposite way and started talking about people needing to eat healthy and you know run 5ks and lift kettlebells and all this stuff in order to avoid it and talking about kids don't need it kids don't need to get the vaccine like he went really super hard the opposite way i don't know what happened something changed within the space of a year where he went from being really cautious about it and advising people to take care um and obviously kind of pushing people or insinuating that he was obviously for you know vaccination and all that stuff and then soon after you kind of fast forward it and all of a sudden he's telling young people don't get it there's no need to if you're fit and healthy you're fine which basically insinuates that he doesn't get he didn't get the vaccine himself because he thought you know the saunas and the cryo chambers and the cold baths would be enough to stave off a virus that has kind of you know taken the lives of many many thousands of people around the world some i think it might be into the millions i don't really try and look at those death counters but regardless 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 so the story broke obviously over the last couple of days or well, yesterday, actually, here's a story from New York Times because they're obviously basking in the glory of Joe Rogan getting COVID because they absolutely detest him. <laughs> it says here, Joe Rogan, a podcasting giant who has been dismissive of a vaccine, has COVID. I will say he's been dismissive of the vaccine. He's just been questioned. He's just been um, skeptical of it, which I think you're allowed to be. But nowadays, unless you're like pro vaccinations, you're basically anti vax, which is insane. But hey, um, or unless you're raging pro, you're definitely anti-vax. So it says here, Joe Rogan, the host of a usually popular podcast, Joe Rogan Experience, said on Wednesday that he had tested positive for the coronavirus after he returned from a series of shows in Florida where the virus is rampant. Mr. Rogan, who was rebuked uh, by federal officials last spring for suggesting that the podcast that young, healthy people need not to get COVID vaccinations, said that he started feeling sick on Saturday night after he returned from performing in Orlando, Tampa and Fort Lauderdale. Now, he's not wrong there, here, in it? For the most part, still, most p young people don't really need to get the vaccine because it doesn't really affect young people the same way it affects people of an older age right but i guess what they're trying to do with the vaccinations is say it might not affect you but in terms of being safer than sorry and ensuring that most people are protected because young people are going to be the ones traveling around more and maybe being more asymptomatic and whatnot without realizing duh, 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 it might be more beneficial for people to get a vaccine cool that's what they're saying right but i don't think this is wrong this isn't incorrect this is still true it's just that at the time people didn't want to hear it they were just wanted to hear everybody being super overly compliant about getting the vaccinations it's just it's an interesting place to be really interesting place to be in society but let's hear from the horse's mouth um joe rogan himself how exactly he contracted it and how he's feeling let's see from the big man let's see what he said hello friends so i got back from the road saturday night feeling very weary i had a headache and i just felt just run down and just to be cautious i separated from my family slept in a different part of the house and throughout the night i got fevers and sweats and i knew what was going on so i got up in the morning got tested and turned went for a run turns out i got covid <laughs> So we immediately threw the kitchen sink at it. All kinds of meds, monoclonal antibodies, uh, ivermectin, z uh prednisone, everything. Uh, and I also got an NAD drip and a vitamin drip. And I did that three days in a row. And so here we are on Wednesday and I feel great. I really only had one bad day. Sunday sucked, but Monday was better. 
Tuesday felt better than Monday, and today I feel good. I actually feel pretty fucking good. Uh, that's the good news. The bad news is we have to move Friday, the Friday show in Nashville. Uh, it's going to move to Sunday, October 24th. So that will be the new Nashville date. My apologies to everyone. Obviously, there's nothing that I can control. Um, it is what it is. Crazy times we're living in. Uh, but a wonderful, heartfelt thank you to Modern Medicine for pulling me out of this so quickly and easily. And uh, my love to all of you. Thank you. Bye. When he talks about Modern Medicine, does he mean just the cocktail drugs he's on to recover from COVID? Or does he mean the vaccine too? And it's interesting too, because he doesn't really say that he got the vaccine, which I probably don't think he did go, he did get it. If you kind of read between the lines, especially when you read, when you kind of um, pass what people like Brendan Shaw have been saying, who essentially does everything that Joe Rogan tells him to do. Um, I don't think he got the vaccine. So I'd imagine somebody like a Joe would probably tell Brendan, you're fit, you're healthy, you ride your bike all the way, you don't need to get the vaccine, blah, blah, blah. So he probably didn't get it anyway, which is understandable. Um, you know, everyone's got their um, right to do what they want to do. But the funny thing is, it's just a reaction to it, man. People are really happy that he got it. It's just strange, isn't it? Very bizarre, this world we live in at the moment, where if you're skeptical about the vaccine and you contract COVID, people are basically preemptively dancing on your grave for whatever reason it's just odd because the the truth of the matter is this is joe rogan right jeremy you know I mean? he's got more money than you know most people he'll be fine he's got access to some of the best doctors in the world it might knock him for six for a while but he'll be completely okay um you know look at donald trump he's like a severely unhealthy guy right incredibly unhealthy guy sorry not severely he's an incredibly unhealthy guy he eats mcdonald's every day drinks coca-colas um doesn't believe in working out and so uh, allegedly he was meant to be on death's door when he contracted covid but he was saved because he basically had access to all the best doctors and medicine money could buy right nothing was off bounds right he took every experimental drug that was kind of working and it kind of saved him and which is kind of led to that iconic thing where he's on the thing where he's on the um where he's on the balcony he's like <sighs> kind of breathing still heavy and trying to show that he's strong and shit right so joe will be fine it's not as if like he's gonna die tomorrow he'll be completely fine let's relax but people are really happy that he got it um because the funny thing is i don't think it's gonna send the signal that people think it's going to send to him i think people are thinking it's going to make him you know wake up and think oh yeah maybe i should be advising people to say the vaccine he's not going to do that i think he's quite clearly set his stall out to be the health and fitness guy because it's needed i think because no one really speaks about health and fitness and the importance of of it in terms of combating something like covid and um, for whatever reason don't want to get into that because i don't really give a shit but it's really full-hearted to think that he's going to come around and somehow do a 180 i don't think so i think if anything he's going to double down even more on his position right that people shouldn't be locked down it doesn't really do much to you i'm 50 something and i recovered in a week da, 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 da. He's, you know what he's going to say it's, he's just made too much of a concerted, concerted effort to basically pour doubt and cast not or to cast doubt on any kind of conventional thinking around covid where you'd think that suddenly because he got it he's not going to change he's not and i don't think he should do i think it's quite nice and healthy to have people like him in the public discourse who might say some dumb things might say some smart things concerning covid because for, for the sake of it or for the what i've seen so far the governments and some scientific bodies or some virologists don't really know what they're talking about either when it comes to covid right there was a time when they were telling people that you shouldn't be wearing masks because or you shouldn't be buying them because you know hospitals need them and now we're at a point where people are telling you you shouldn't be wearing the cloth ones at all because they don't work and this doesn't like it's just so much conflicting information out there that I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing to add one more person talking out of their asshole in the conversation. It is what it is. Everyone's really talking out of their ass. No one really knows what they're talking about. If anything, the one thing that we can kind of really put our hat on is the fact that vaccines probably do more good than they do bad. We know that for sure, right? We know that we can't really, uh, you know, we don't, we're not in a situation where we can supply everybody that's contracting with COVID, that gets contracted with COVID or gets COVID or, you know, whatever. Um, we can't really afford most places can't afford to give each person a cocktail of medicines and drugs in order for, for them to get better so the thing that they do the one-stop shop that can help everybody is to get a jab right a couple of jabs and that should help most people that's basically the thinking i think behind everything which makes complete sense but for whatever reason it's been complicated and muddy than we are where we are now but again the reaction to 
Joe Joe getting it has been so interestingly odd. Um, people want him to die in shit. He's going to be fine. He's going to recover. He's going to double down, triple down his position prior to this also. And people are going to keep getting mad. People are going to keep getting angry. And he's just going to keep pressing record. I think it's a little bit of a thankless task, but you know, it is what it is. It is what it is. What else we got here? I think is that it. That might be it, you know. I think I've been working on that already, or not? I think it's been less than an hour, isn't it? Yeah, it's definitely been. It's been 53. Oh, man. Okay, anyway, it's been 53, but let's stop there because I don't have much more to talk about, to be completely honest. So, this has been the Excellence English episode number 491. Thanks so much for tuning in. As per usual, it's been a pleasure to have your company. If it's your first time, check out the show. Make sure you smash the like, hit subscribe, and leave a comment down below. If you listen via the podcast app, please send me a five star review. It'll only take you five minutes, and of course, will help me a bunch. So, please do that if you don't mind. And of course, I'll see you guys again very, very soon. Like I said, I'm going to be going to the clubs this weekend. So be prepared for field recordings and my inner thinkings behind what goes on there and all that malarkey and some more stuff. And of course, my website's up and running at the moment too, excellentzinger.com. Find all my links to stuff that I do and the things I get up to creatively on there as well, if you're interested. And, you know, I'll see you guys very soon. Take care. Be safe. Peace.